for News Prime. This is indeed Joy News Prime, Ghana's most comprehensive two hours of television news, but also seen across Africa and beyond, including NTV in Uganda. My name is Israel Lai. Coming up, more clients of embattled microfinance firm BKM scramble for properties of the company after securing multiple court orders. Security beefed up at Bewa Palace in Yendi in the northern region following threats of renewed violence by rival gates in protracted Dagmon conflict. Ministry of Health yet to procure vaccines for deadly pneumococcal meningitis as the disease claims more lives. The World Health Organization has meanwhile been asked to intervene. And in business tonight, Bank of Ghana maintains its policy rate at 26%. A slowdown in inflation as a result of its tight monetary policy stance. In Tema, region police arrest husband of 29-year-old woman accused of attempting to murder her while seven months pregnant with their child. Now, apart from the business news, which comes up in about 30 minutes, we'd also have entertainment, sports, and Joy News Interactive. This bulletin is also available on ABN Television, on the Sky platform across Europe, as well as on Freeview Connect. Stay tuned. It is now confirmed at least 33 people have so far died in the latest outbreak of the deadly pneumococcal meningitis. Though the increase in the fatalities came out last Friday, they were only confirmed by the Ministry of Health at a news conference on Monday. The ministry, meanwhile, says it is presently using antibiotics to fight the disease as it works on getting the vaccines needed to deal with the outbreak. The Health Ministry announced that 153 people have been infected in the Bronga Hafu, Northern and Ashanti regions. The ministry at the moment does not have vaccines to deal with the outbreak and is alternatively using antibiotics as a form of treatment for infected persons. In a bid to contain the spread of the disease, the Ministry of Health has stepped up its campaign in the affected areas while it seeks support from the World Health Organization to handle the outbreak. So this year, a lot of interventions have taken place already. Normally, for October, a health alert is sent to the health facilities to remind them that we are entering the, we are entering the season. So you look out for fever, headache, and neck pains. But as I told you, it is more profoundly done in the northern part of the country. So the clinicians are more alert. They can easily pick the cases. And also, the awareness creation is more in the northern part of the country. So those things have been started already. The ministry has also sent some money to the, the regions um, to support them in preparation. WHO does a lot. They produce the test kits. For meningitis, you need to be sure of the diagnosis. You can clinically suspect it, but you need to confirm. So there's a the test kit that they call Pastorex. It's a rapid diagnostic test. And that one is purely provided by WHO over the period. So this year, you provided six packs. They were distributed, and that has been used in managing these outbreaks. So there are clear plans that have been, that has been on course preparing us for, the, for this outbreak. But let me say that the, 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 the burden exceeded somehow the expectation. Because, as I said earlier, Bravo is not a typical location for meningitis. So suspicion is low, clinicians are suspecting malaria, and they get worse before they, they think it could be um, meningitis. That's why I'm counting for the high disease burden. But I think that with the heightened awareness, as I said, we expect that cases will be going up with time, the cases will do, go down, and there will be no fatalities and then, and then uh, increasing cases. But the threat still remains. So far as we are in a dry season, I think that we still have to keep working on our surveillance and effective case management. The most pressing issue, according to the Deputy Minister of Health, is finding the cases early and ensuring that patients report early to the hospital for rapid treatment. When we say that there is no cause for alarm, it doesn't mean that there is no problem. There is a challenge. What we are saying is that together with the districts, the region, ourselves, our partners like WHO, we have in place the elements to deal with the issue getting the cases to come out early, getting people to have the information so that if they have the symptoms and signs, they can come to hospital early. Once they are treated early, then we can 
get everything under, under control. Government is doing everything in its power to provide the resources to make sure that this is brought down in the shortest possible time. And we will urge you to continue to work with us, provide the messaging for this to be snuffed out at the earliest possible time. The help so far from the World Health Organization includes laboratory equipment, which are basically test kits for the diagnosis of the disease. Well, the health ministry is to for the deadly pneumococcal meningitis through sole sourcing due to the intensity of the outbreak in parts of the country. Health Minister Alex Segwefio revealed he gave a directive on Monday for the procurement of the vaccines to deal with the disease. He was giving some answers on how the health ministry is managing the disease when he appeared before the Public Accounts Committee. It's a circumstantial issue. The circumstances will dictate whether an item requires sole sourcing or not. So almost in most cases, or in some cases, there are issues which, even though you would go through the general process of procurement, may require sole sourcing. I've just had to do a sole sourcing for vaccines for meningitis, because normally that would go through a normal process, but because there's a potential issue happening, they have gone into sole sourcing, because we've looked at those who have them in stock immediately in the country to get them. So I'm not sure that the, the, the question is a very general one, but if there are specific items that are required, I can ask the uh, procurement officer for Ghana Health Service to... Minister, you mean you did, you give instructions for the meningitis vaccines on the SUSO saying without approval of the procurement board? No, with no. approval of PPA. Exactly. So sourcing is part of... Yeah, so. Yeah. Now, very little is heard and said of this new strain of meningitis, which has been recorded in parts of the country. The disease has already claimed 33 lives, as you just heard, in three regions in Ghana. Join News' Matilda Vomega reports on the signs and symptoms to look out for. In Ghana, the worst outbreak of meningitis, cerebrospinal meningitis, CSM, occurred in 1994 and 1996. It affected 17,000 people, leaving 1,000 people dead. According to the Ministry of Health, the present strain of the disease is not the normal one which the country is used to. The latest is caused by a bacteria known as streptococcal pneumonia. Fortunately, the new strain, although more deadly, does not spread as fast as CSM. Cocal meningitis occurs when the bacteria invades the bloodstreams and infects the membranes protecting the brain and the spinal cord. Meningitis is a serious and potentially fatal disease. It kills one out of ten patients. Pneumococcal meningitis is transmitted from person to person. The bacteria is spread through tiny droplets from an infected person's mouth, throat or nose. For example, if someone with infection coughs or sneezes on or near you, you may contract the disease. People with symptoms and signs suggestive of meningitis, such as fever, headache, neck stiffness, should report immediately to the nearest health facility. The general public, especially those who live within the meningitis belt, such as the three regions in the north, Bronk Ahafu and Ashanti regions, are being advised to avoid crowded places, ensure enough ventilation in rooms, and prevent dryness of the throat by drinking more water. Cover your nose and mouth when you sneeze or cough. Avoid sharing personal products like spoons, toothbrush, cups, and with others. Matilda Pomagan for Joy News, Accra. Now, in other news, the Attorney General is being blamed for not enforcing recommendations of the for the prosecution of those accused of financial and other administrative irregularities in the Auditor General's report. Vice Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee of Parliament, Samuel Atacha, is warning until the Attorney General begins to prosecute, work of the Auditor General and PAC will amount to nothing. Issues of violations of the Act dominated PAC's hearing on Monday following revelations that some 332 vehicles procured for the Health Ministry in 2009 valued at over 10 million CDs was done without recourse to the law. Well, two dimensions. First of all, it could be that they do not appreciate the criminal implications of their actions. Because it's, they might want to say that this is an administrative lapse. But as we've underlined, the law is so clear that it can go to jail because of an infraction resulting from your disrespect for the Procurement Act. 
The second of all, which is, I think is very serious, that we all feel the attorney general in these matters. Every criminal's action is at the suit of the attorney general. And therefore, if the attorney general will not demonstrate to the whole Ghanaians that if you fell far of the procurement act, I'm going to prosecute you, this impunity will go on. But, I mean, going to a report, apart from the embezzlement, mm. Procurement Act and violations of it are quite pronounced in all the reports that has come before the the uh, the, the PAC. Mm. I, I mean, my point is, is the understanding of the act, you know, the issue here, as far as the application of it by the public sector workers is concerned. It's not only that. It could be a very terrible vehicle for corruption. We understand. Like, so sourcing and the rest of it. Ham, pick your friend to come and render a service so that you get your kickbacks and the rest of it. So what is the Procurement Act about? Mm -hmm. Probity, transparency, and accountability. And if you do not go by the Procurement Act, you know, that public sector corruption cannot be checked properly. And we have passed a lot that says that even <coughs> in an event you want to undertake so sourcing, it might come under certain conditions. Clearly, what they have done doesn't fall within what so sourcing, you know, uh, condition detects. I, I, it doesn't fall within that at all. And that is a very fair assessment that you've made. And it's all because they are not afraid that they'll be punished if they fall foul of the law. But if they know that somebody can go to jail, a minimum of uh, a maximum of five years for an administrative lapse or whatever you call it, the whole system will change. News Prime, we're taking a break at this point. When we come back, we have more stories coming up. Don't go away. Watching Join News Prime, we're returning to stories to do with health. Chief Executive of the Kolibu Teaching Hospital, Dr. Gilbert Bakul, is warning of serious financial difficulties if government decides to take off the hospital from state subvention or take the hospital off government subvention. Government is in the process of weaning off some state enterprises deemed capable of surviving on their own. The initiative will enable the affected establishments to use the generated the funds to pay its staff. But Dr. Buckle is warning the hospital may be forced to demand full cost for health care if Kolibu is taking of government subvention. Meanwhile, Health Minister Alex Segwefia says the ministry has been directed to, by government to pay for the cost of electricity and water at all health facilities. He indicates that the ministry is drawing up an exercise to use part of its budgetary allocation for goods and services to pay for electricity used. I think that the Director General has conceded that something was amiss. He's indicated that a process was used where they looked at a number of people and went through a supply uh, situation, but there was no PPA approval, not even for sole sourcing. That is the term that has been used here, but there was no PPA, not even for, and so it became a matter which needed investigation. The matter was then sent to Yoko. I hear my colleague's question, when did you last write, etc. Yes, we should do a chase up. But at the end of the day, it's with a... Just again, let's look at the paragraph 962 that deals with the purchase of or procurement condoms. What was also the issue that we had to sole source? Yes, yeah, it's been, it's been done. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Government here, more director, internal audit. Uh, for a condom, it went through competitive bidding. It was not soon source, but I learned during the audit they were not able to produce the document, and I'm sure it's here that procurement department has produced. That is a far line down there, so it has not been produced all the competitive process. When, please? Uh, they said they located it, was it last week? The, the procurement department, they located a file. They seem to have the facts, please. So if you don't have the facts, we know what they say they say. The procurement unit is here. So if you are not uh, sure of what you are saying, please, we are very serious. So. I would ask for the procurement officer of Ghana Health Services. Procurement officer, yes. Let's, let's hear from you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. The procurement of the condoms as well as the test kit, because they've been put together, were actually out, uh, issued out of a competitive tendering process. I must admit that at the time of the audit, we could not locate the files. Um, we actually have a challenge with space at the headquarters there. And because of the numerous tendering that we do and the, the nature, the bulky nature of the documents, we have actually sent most of our documents to the archives. Some are with our institutional archives, some have gone to the national archives. So at the time when they came, we could not get, at that time, get the document to support our position that it was not a source. So we had just the award and the contract letters without these files. So eventually we had to, we were able, to, we managed to get it. How long did it take you to locate the files? It's taken a while. Sorry. Uh, security has beefed up at the Gbiwa Palace in Yindi in the northern region following threats by members of the Abudu royal family that they will use all means available to perform the final funeral rites of their late chief Nam Amadou Abdullahi IV there. They are going Interior Minister Marco Yongo is also appealing to the two rival factions in Yendi, Abudus and Andanis to exercise restraint as government and the Committee of Eminent Chiefs try to resolve their grievances. It will be recalled that at the weekend, the regional minister for the northern region assured the general public that security was being beefed up at Yendi and other sensitive areas. Uh, in fact, the Regional Security Council is monitoring the situation and then will advise government accordingly. In the interim, what the ministry is going to do is to appeal to the eminent chiefs to speed up work on the funeral arrangements and for restoring peace to the area. I would also want to use this opportunity to appeal to the two factions to exercise restraint. Because I know that the eminent chiefs have gone so far in restoring peace to the area, finding lasting solution to the area. So my appeal is that they exercise some restraint to allow the eminent chiefs to conclude their work. In the interim also, the Regional Security Council will continue to monitor the situation and advise government accordingly. You are tightening security. Are you sending in more men? That's the uh, implication. Uh, if you are beefing up security, you will be sending more men and logistics so that in the event of an outbreak of violence, you'll be able to contain the situation. Now, you say the Committee of Eminent are intervening in the matter, but what sort of intervention are you looking at since the Abudu family last week expressed lack of confidence in them? Well, it's unfortunate, but uh, I, I don't know why they don't have the confidence in the three eminent chiefs. They have not yet come out with their findings, and uh, I think it's to be premature for them to uh, conclude that they have no confidence now, the appeal follows a rise in tension in Dagmo, a community which has really not known peace since the 2002 conflict between the two families, which led to the death of the overlord of Dagbon, Yana Yakubu and Daini II, on January 11, 2016. The Abudo royal family in the Dagbon Chieftain City Divide served notice to government in the Tunfo Mediation Committee that they will explore other alternative means to occupy the Gbewa Palace to perform the funeral of the late Na Mamadou Abdullah IV. If they fail to grant them access to the palace by today, Monday, January 25. We refuse to condone the uncustomary and illegal recognition and prestige bestowed on the Kugana by the Sentinel Committee and the President. The fate of our great kingdom cannot be bound to the political delusion of a usurper. The family is therefore decided not to cooperate with any decision on customary matters that does not have the blessing of the Gushego regent.
We can only achieve lasting peace in the kingdom through the spirit of cooperation, compromise, and give and take. We in the Abudu family have demonstrated these qualities throughout the mediation process. The least we expect is commensurate reciprocity, but not outright indignation. But over the weekend, uh, and Daniel Royal family vowed to protect themselves from any attack from the Abudu Royal family. And Danny family says it is ready to engage in another war over the Abudu's notice to forcibly enter the Gbewa Palace to perform the funeral rites of the late Regent Na Muhammadu Abdullah IV. The Abudu Royal family has been adamant about apologizing for the crime. Neither has the family ever showed any remorse whatsoever has borne out by their latest statement in which they are threatening more fire and brimstone. But we serve notice that if they start a violent confrontation this time, they will be embarking on a suicide mission. We of the Andani family wish to convey to Dr. Nantong Mama and his extremists here in the Abu Royal family. They are, they are ready for a confrontation. Now, checks at the Minsha Palace suggest authorities are upset about the latest outbursts between the Abudu and Andani Gate over the protracted peace process. Sources describe the development as unfortunate because it comes as a committee of eminent chiefs gets closer to clinching a deal for lasting peace. As Antihinio Utunfo said to the second, is leading the mediating effort. Now, joining us uh, on the line, I said, he has been speaking with some of the sources at Minsha Palace, and he's come through for us. Good evening to you, Said. So what's the very latest on uh, what you're hearing from the sources at Minsha Palace? Yes, easy. What we are picking from the Minsha Palace, even though the sources are not official, you know, is that the authorities are surprised at the development uh, regarding the disagreement between both factions, you know, in the Dagon conflict especially coming at a time when they had agreed on the final lap of the road map. You know, after the burial of the Yana and the installation of the Kugana, the major thing that is left now is for the funeral of the two late Yanas to be performed. So on the 6th of December, both factions met at the Manchia Palace and agreed to a road map, uh, which is, you know, a four-stage development which would have led to the final installation of Ayana for Dagbon. And according to the road map, information is that uh, they initially had wanted to implement it, you know, right after the meeting. But because of the Tamba Festival, they decided to hold on until after uh, that uh, you know, occasion. And so between the 8th and 15th of January, the plan was that the Abudus will have access to the, the War Palace to perform the funeral of the late Yana Muhammadu Abdullah. Then, they will, between 15th to 22nd of January, they would have observed what my sources describe as a rest period, after which the Abudus will, uh, the Andanis, will take their turn to perform the funeral of the late Yana Yakubu Andani up to 29th of January. And so the anticipation was that by the fate of next month, that is February, Dabon should have been getting a, a, a new IANA which will bring an end to the entire peace process. So authorities are telling me that, sources are telling me that the authorities are upset because after agreeing on this, but for the Dabon uh, Damba Festival, this process would have gone very far. And by now, would have been getting to the end of it. But for them to have gone back after a very frank discussion which ended in a very relaxed atmosphere at the palace, they are very upset and surprised that this thing will culminate in the recent development. So that is the situation within the Manchester Palace. Uh, I'm unable to tell exactly the next move will be but what I gather is that the two factions are likely to be invited back to the palace to if I go through this roadmap again and see if this time round they will be able to reach a consensus. 
All right, thank you very much. You heard uh, Love Affirm's Said Ali Yaku, his news editor at Love Affirm, and he's been following the story for quite a long time. Now, you're watching Joy News Prime. We're taking a break, but still to come in the bulletin. Tema Region Police arrest husband of 29 year old woman accused of attempting to murder her while seven months pregnant with their child. We have business coming up after this break. Stay tuned. Right, it's time now for business and uh, one of the main stories that has been dominating uh, the news today has to do with the policy rate right, which the Bank Israel. of Ghana has maintained. Uh, and I'm very years. excited about that Israel because you remember when uh, we were given the third tranche of our money under the, the IMF, IMF program, they said that we should tighten policy rates. And so most people we spoke with, most economists said that they were going to increase the policy rate. And that's not good news. And so I'm very excited that the Bank of Ghana maintained it as well. Okay, all right, take it away. <laughs> All right, now the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of Ghana has kept the central bank's policy rate and changed at 26%. The governor, Dr. Henry Kofi Wampa, who announced the decision, said it was because of the relatively brighter economic outlook. The decision by the Bank of Ghana to keep the rate unchanged could also mean that the interest rates that banks will pay on monies taken from the central bank may not witness any increase a decision that will not impact negatively on the cost of borrowing in the country. According to the governor of the central bank, Dr. Kofi Wampa, the policy rate was not increased because there wasn't any threat to inflation and economic growth outlook. The committee has decided to maintain the policy rate at 26%. The latest release by the Ghana Statistical Service puts inflation at 17.7% in December 2015 up marginally from 17.6% in November and 17.4% in October. This indicates some moderation in price movements over the previous month. The sl slower pace of inflation reflects the tight monetary policy stance and ongoing fiscal consolidation. The committee therefore concluded that the current tight monetary policy stance supported by the continued fiscal consolidation and improvement in the energy situation would provide the necessary impetus to rein in inflation pressures. The governor assured businesses that there are measures in place to ensure the local currency does not depreciate to worsening levels. That wasn't the case much earlier. So we still see people buying ahead of even their needs for, for it. And we are also taking our policies. We continue the uh, tightness of monetary policy. Fiscal consolidation will continue. And, and our normal flows, what we have also stepped at is smoothening the flows. You know that most of the flows come in the fourth quarter. We are doing uh, a smoothening of those flows so that we can get some of those flows ahead so that you don't have a situation where demand far outstrips supply. Dr. Wampa also announced it has begun its policy to stop lending to government totally. There's zero net financing and we are working closely with government because it is a, an effort that we, we have to coordinate together to ensure that um, we achieve that and we do regular monitoring between the technical people to ensure that the forecasting, the main thing is how you forecast the payments and, and the inflows and to do it in such a way that you match your payments with, with the inflows. And we, we've started doing that already. On the recent audit of the IMF to access the financial position of banks, the central bank governor noted there might be need to up capital of these institutions. 
In another development, the head of economics department at the University of Ghana, Professor Peter Korte, is not happy with the consistent use of the policy rate to target inflation control. Speaking on the marketplace on Joy News a while ago, Professor Korte said even though he is in agreement with the current decision by the Bank of Ghana to maintain the policy rate, inflation must be managed by also focusing on the supply side causes as well. If there are other pressures causing inflation, mm. um, utility prices have gone up, cost of transport will go up, and several others. So it is affecting the supply side, and that is what is for further inflation. You don't need interest rate increases to address supply side. You rather either maintain or even reduce interest rate. The businesses can borrow at cheaper rate and be able to produce more uh, because already their cost of doing business is gone up, and you can worsen the situation. You definitely have to provide a cheaper and better access to credit, including doing other things that will reduce the cost of doing business. By so doing, there will be more uh, goods on the market, and that can also dampen the inflationary effect. What I don't um, subscribe to is the idea of a single-digit inflation, mm. because I don't think for a developing country like ours, uh, that is where we should go in, uh, the direction we should be moving towards. The Ghana Stock Exchange could be losing out to other markets in Africa in terms of investments attraction because of the removal of some tax reliefs. That's the fear of the managing director of the Ghana Stock Exchange, Kofi Yamwa. George Yafi has more on the concerns by the boss of the local boards. The concerns by the boss of the Ghana Stock Exchange has been influenced by government's decision to take away tax incentives granted to persons and businesses that invest on the market. This follows the introduction of the revised income tax. Boss of the stock market, Kofi Amwa, tells Joy Business the development is not good for the market. Something that has always been a major attraction as far as the Ghanaian market is concerned, now we're taking it off. And we think of taking also off the 3% for three years rebate that SMEs get when they list on the market for the first three. And there are also provisions in this new act which threatens the survival of existing mutual funds because there's some element or clause in it which essentially taxes existing mutual funds and gives some exemption to new mutual funds that have been set up. These are concerns for, for the capital market. and Most stock markets in the sub-region have a 0% tax rate on capital gains. Therefore, putting this tax on investments on persons who trade on the Ghana Stock Exchange is seen as not too good. But government has maintained that it is still looking into the concerns and see whether there can be any reviews to the law. Time to go to the stock and commodity markets. Uh, you remember on Business Life, we told you how the week ended. Now we are telling you what the week was today. Ended around, the market close around 3 p.m. And John is here to tell us where to invest. Hello, John. Hi, tell John. me we have some good news. On the stock market. Exactly. You know, usually the market has some mixed news out there. I mean, you know, out there. some good, some bad. Right. But in all situations and circumstances, it's good for some businessman somewhere, whether good or bad. Of course, today on the Ghana Stock Exchange, we saw some trade going on there. Almost the market had about 361,491 volume traded at a total of 5 million 144 that's quite significant but that's quite significant exactly that also tells you if you look at the difference between differences between the volume traded and the value traded you have some sharp differences do you see there. any movement because we that's saw a lot of movement but what it means is that a lot of high cap um equities traded, traded. okay lower volumes by high cost per share right. trade. That's how can we have that differences. Right. And of course, both uh, indices or in the indices, yes, also um, did not see that much in terms of when you compare to last Friday. Right. We had the composite index also declining by almost about, going about um, one, 0 0.18 basis point. Right. And also um, the financial index going about 8.9 basis point. Right. What it means is that if you had actually moved, um, invested in here, your money will grow by this percentage. That's what basically it means. Okay? okay, that is how fantastic. But let's look at how or which equities actually help this briefly. market actually move right. briefly. briefly. That is exactly what it is. We had only one equity losing and two equities actually.
gaining, helping the market to gain this particular uh, stature in there. We had Goyal, SIC gaining, adding one peso each to their investors. What happened well, to Benso Oil Palm Plantation today? Benso is today? actually missing in action, I'm very today, sure. Today, yes, because Charlie has uh, been my baby for some time. But of course, <laughs> Benso will come up, but I think okay. Benso this year is not doing that well, well okay. you know, because of the challenges they've had with respect to um, the energy situation, right. the power situation and all. So that has been a bad car yeah. loss, a peso today. Car loss. That's how, Let's go that's to the commodity market. Crude, as of Friday, was $31 per barrel. Today, Any good it news? is $30.92. Oh, it's gone down. Cent. Okay, Right. lost one dollar twenty eight cent per barrel here and you know if you, if, if you look at it today alone it's almost about four percent of its value or it's shared about four percent of its value. value gold keeps gaining now it's some, somewhere around one thousand one hundred and six point two six um dollars per ounce so that's basically how it is which is which is which is good keeps losing. Coco Coco lost about 51 dollars it's been today. losing since last week it's not exactly good. so i think last year it, it kept losing and right. this year Continuing. So that's basically Let's wrap up with a CD. Let's wrap the up with CD, a CD quickly. The CD, the CD not being well, as almost we have for Friday. Right. It's only gained against the euro. Lost to the US dollar, the British pound, and the But Chinese I hope one. when we have the inflows from the uh, um, IMF, I'm we sure it will stabilize. We are going to see a lot of stability in the, in the Thank CD. You. Basically, that's how it is. Thank so you, John. That has been the market. Thank you so much for that analysis. And that's how we wrap up with business. My name is Eton Amsim. Many thanks for your time. For more news, log on to myjoyonline.com. You're watching Joy News Prime. Organized Labour has been holding a crunch meeting ahead of the final negotiations with government over the recently increased utility tariffs and new taxes. This follows a more than 70% increase in electricity tariffs and new taxes with organized labor insistent government must cut back on the increases. Joy News' Kwabran Pichum was in the meeting at the TUC head office here in Accra and reports. The Trades Union Congress is scheduled to meet government for the third time on Tuesday to press home demands for the removal of the energy sector levy imposed on petroleum products and a substantial reduction in the recent increases in electricity tariffs. A consultative meeting was held today for the various labor unions that formed the TUC to give feedback on progress so far made and how to strategize for the meeting with government. Leaders of organized labor are tight-lipped on this strategy, but joint news sources indicate an agreement was reached on a new percentage of reductions to be demanded for the utility tariffs. The TUC is also expected to back down on its earlier position that the energy sector levy is totally removed and rather settle for a substantial cut to the percentage. Deliberations were also held on the next action to take after last week's demonstrations if their demands are not upheld by government. A nationwide strike has not been ruled out. Customers of the now defunct Power Grounds Microfinance Company Limited at Avrongo in the Upper East Region are asking or are calling the, on their Member of Parliament, Marco Yongo, to intervene and help them retrieve monies they invested with the company. The customers took to the streets of Bogatanga on Monday to publicly express their frustration with the situation. Dozens of customers of the Power Grounds Microfinance Company at Navrongo poured onto the streets in a demonstration to register their frustrations and to call for the arrest of managers of the microfinance company. They claimed several reports they've made to the police about the failure of the company to return their investments have yielded no results as the operators of the company have been left scot-free even though they have not paid back the monies they owe customers. To save the full regards of the law, for deceiving and collecting monies of poor market women, students, teachers, health workers, security personnel, and a lot of others. The devastating effects of this scam cannot be underestimated. Marriages are broken, businesses have collapsed, education of some truncated, and a lot of the affected people frustrated and resorted to alcoholism. This cannot be an issue for us to fall our hands over. We also, we understand that the MP for Navarongo Central Constituency Honorable Mark Owen Wuyongo assisted the CEO to get the ban placed by the Yoko lifted to access the account and pay the customers. The CEO has failed the MP, the customers and government as a whole. Subsequently, we have suffered far too long and appeal to you to use your high office to get our monies for us. 
the aggrieved customers of the Power Grounds Microfinance Company want their MP, Mark Oyongo, to get the CEO of the Microfinance Company interdicted. We are by this petition calling you, call on you, Minister for Interior, as a matter of agency in one week, call for the interdiction of the CEO of Power Grounds Micro Limited and also his managers for them to refund our monies to save lives and the suffering masses of investors and their families. Elsewhere, customers of another embattled microfinance firm, DKM, went into the Teichimang and offices to retrieve some movable properties of the company to defray some of the debts owed them by the company. Other customers were, however, frustrated and uh, they were unhappy with the turn of events, accusing the Bank of Ghana of doing very little to protect their interests because obviously there wouldn't be much left for them for the Bank of Ghana to liquidate. Now, over 20 DKM buses have also been impounded in this exercise. You are a customer here. Yes. Why would you, a foreigner from China, want to invest? Because the interest. Because of the interest? Yes. They tell me 55% interest. So I come, I put some money here. First time I put 200 million. No give me. And uh, say um, this one called, called what? Production. Um, no, promotion. I put another 200 million inside. No, no, give me one peso. So now, how much money do you have? 400. 400 million. Yes. Cities. Yes. It's locked up here. Uh, and it's like 40, 400, no, uh, 40,000, 40,000 new cities. 40,000 Ghana cities. Yes, yes. It's locked up here. Yes. And I'm sure you can see people with orders packing things and, and all that. What is running through your mind? And I believe that it should be coordinated very well so that um, each and every one will be able to get something out of it. Because if the evidence are destroyed, then I don't know whether it has been um, kept somewhere apart from this place. Because if computers are taken away, if um, um, what do you call um, generator, um, what do you call air conditioners and everything is taken away. I don't know what is left then. Because the, um, they are noticed there is even a court order, somebody trying to claim even the building. So at the end of the day, the regulator that came in to initiate this action, we are not feeling what they are doing. It's, it looks like they just started and left the thing in the hands of the individuals. And those that have the ability to seek for a court order are picking the things one by one. So at the end of the day, we don't know what will be left for the ordinary people who will be on the streets. So this is our concern. We believe that Bank of Ghana, what they started, they should complete it so that everybody will be able to have something out of it. Right, so staying with the DKM issue, there was a similar uh, issue in Wa and Rafiq Salam put together this report. Diamond Microfinance Company, in the Wa municipality, located at Wapani and Fungu. They have both been inactive since October 20, 2015, thereby putting their customers out of business and giving some sleepless nights. However, upon seeing gun-wielding policemen in the company of court officials and a carpenter, they forgot about their troubles with the hope that the company was going to be operational again for them to collect their deposits. But it wasn't to be, as after a few minutes, they saw properties belonging to the company being carted out. They include flat-screen Samsung TV sets, air conditioners, furniture, laptop and desktop computers, wall clocks, fire extinguishers and Benetton standing fans. Some of the customers moved away in anger and stood akimbo while the police cutted out the items. In an interview with Joy News, some of them welcomed the decision of the court order, whilst others were of the opinion that it was an opportunity to dupe them. 
First, I want to pay for my, this, my brother, my junior brother's school fees. Because of the money, he's going to the school, but we own the school. So and if I sleep, I can't sleep because of the five million. The way things are going on, I don't think some of us can get our money. Well, there are indications that these uh, items that they are picking or sending away, we don't know why they are sending them to. And I don't know, there isn't any uh, effort to mobilize the money or assure the clients that those of us who have agreed that we are going to get our money. But if they should start moving their property or their assets one after the other, I don't know. I think the future is very bleak for us. Others also blame the Bank of Ghana for shirking their responsibility and allow them to be due by the microfinance company. He was of the belief that it was a knee-jerk reaction which wouldn't yield any results. So the same problem kind they, they are telling us that he's having a problem with the Bank of Ghana. And he has been a system for three good years. So where were Bank of Ghana when this man started from, from the beginning, taking our money? These are some of the questions that we are raising and we can never get an answer to it. Because if somebody is in the system is not doing a correct business, we have other institutions who are capable and who are to monitor them and to see to it that they do the right thing. Why do they allow them to work for the three good years? Now today we are hearing that they are fraud, they are this, they are this. We don't know what is going on. A fixed alarm report from Wa. You're watching Join News Prime. We're taking a break. We'll bring you international news thereafter. All right, we're back from the week. Farkarising is here. What's coming up on Journeys Interactive? Israel, good evening. The pneumococcal meningitis outbreak in the country is gaining grounds with 33 reported deaths so far. So what do you know about this deadly disease? I heard about it in the news, yes. And I, I heard it's, it's been killing some people in the Bonhafo region. That's what I know about it. We'll be doing some education on the fast-spreading virus, but it's not all doom and gloom. We'll be taking a back-sided view of intelligence. There's research out there that seems to suggest a correlation between smarts and a big bomb. It's really true because I, I, I'm an example of it. So My mom has a big butt and I'm really intelligent, so you see. It's all coming up in a bit with me, Ifwa Kwaharsin. Please stay Israel. Know, baby she's gonna have <laughs> we'll have that coming second hour of the bulletin we also have sports and entertainment please stay tuned <music> watching join news prime time now for a week of our top stories and more clients have embattled microfinance from dkm are scrambling for properties of the company after securing multiple court orders you heard incident in Techimang and in Wa. Security has been beefed up at the Gwewa Palace in Yendi in the northern region following threats of renewed violence by rival gates in the protracted Dagon chieftaincy conflict. The Ministry of Health is yet to procure vaccines for the deadly pneumococcal meningitis as the disease claims more lives. The World Health Organization has meanwhile been asked to intervene. as Bank of Ghana maintains its policy rate at 26 percent, citing a slowdown in inflation as a result of its tight monetary policy stance. The police in Tama uh, have arrested one person for the shooting of a 29-year-old pregnant woman. The person in custody is, happens to be the husband. The victim, who was seven months pregnant at the time of the incident, is now paralyzed. 29-year-old Benita Dankwa explains to Manasa Azura Wune how she went to be and woke up, went to, went to bed and woke up with a bullet in her chest, shot at close range. She and her unborn baby miraculously survived the mysterious bullet, which left her paralyzed. Police investigations revealed there was no breaking and the bullet was probably shot from inside the room. Five months after the incident, no one has been, well, five months after the incident, it is only on Friday that the husband was arrested as a prime suspect. Manasa Azura when he has spent weeks investigating the shooting. And 28th August last year, Benita Dankwa went to bed healthy and fit, not knowing 
What would happen in the ensuing hours would change her life forever. The seven months pregnant woman woke up at about 5.30 the following morning only to realize that she had been shot in the chest. Early that morning, I woke up to urinate. After that, he also did the same thing. But he took a very long time in coming. I wanted to go and see what he was really doing. But I was feeling too sleepy, so I slept off. I woke up only to realize that I had been shot. John Asa lives in the same house with Benita and her husband, 33-year-old Effort Dankwa. He says at about 3 a.m. that dawn, he heard a gunshot. When I was sleeping around 3, I heard a gunshot. It was afar. And I didn't, didn't say anything. Then I was there again, I heard another one. That one was too loud. And I was asking myself that I should sleep well because sometimes some people like giving gunshots and if you didn't take them, you in your room, something can, I mean, it can mess up and come and hit you. So I was just there and I was okay, fine. See, it didn't take, like, I think it didn't take hours and then I had my friend call me to come and help her to take his wife to the hospital. Police investigations have revealed the chamber and hall apartment in Tema Community 11, where Benita lived with her husband, was not broken into, which suggests the shot was fired from the room. Benita slept in that room with her husband. This is a house where Benita Duncan was shot on the 29th of August 2015. This is their room, and I'm told these windows lead to the living room and this particular window and then the one behind here actually lead to the bedroom according to the police report, there was no any form of break-in and there is a wire mesh and also a very thick curtain in here so if somebody even shot through this window Probably the person needed to have cut through this wire mesh, lifted the curtains before finding his or her target. But I'm told no form of renovation was made after that incident, and there is no form of breakage or even cutting through this mesh. The Marijin Police Public Relations Officer, ASP Julian Obin, says their investigations are pointing to one direction. And there were things that we found in the room. Let me give you an example. If I'm with you alone in a house and um, I wake up to have some injuries on my body and I find certain other things that has to do with some blood things and there's no other person in the room and there's um, nobody who came to the room and all of that, I think that, um, that your answer or your guess is as good as Benita's husband was arrested, cautioned and granted bail. He has denied any wrongdoing. He also declined comment when Joy News contacted him. A police report available to Joy News indicates a woman called Ernestina Dede Lagbenuku, who was in an amorous relationship with Benita's husband, was also arrested and cautioned. Benita believes her husband shot her. Benita's father, 68-year-old Seth Ohini Renchi, says Effort Dankwa refused to report the shooting of his wife to the police. Doctors say Benita was already paralyzed by the time she got to the hospital. She was delivered of her baby prematurely through a cesarean section, but her husband refused to accept the child. Benita explains why. He never made mention of anything until when this baby came in. He started saying, hey, I've been visiting hospitals and all that. So how would he believe that the baby is his? He got pregnant. Did it ever come up? He never came up. He never made mention of anything like that. Benita is now bedridden. She has lost the ability to pass out urine or human waste. Her 54-year-old mother now has the double responsibility of changing the diapers of her five-month-old grandson and her 29-year-old daughter. As you sit here today, what do you miss most in life? I miss working. I miss working. And I miss being... I miss many things because now I can't do anything. I'm just... 
sitting here all day. If I want to sleep, I sleep. I can't do anything. If I could walk, I could do everything. So that is what I miss most. And do you have hopes of ever getting back to your normal self? Mm. I do. I really do. <laughs> Sometimes I think it will take a long time. <laughs> but I have hope. <laughs> Right, so we have more on uh, Benita's story, hamajoonline.com. It says, uh, shot and paralyzed. Pregnant woman survived shooting. Police suspect her husband. And the Tema region police have told Joy News that the husband would be put before court tomorrow. Now, the Accra High Court has awarded costs of 10,000 CDs against the Ghana Armed Forces in the case in which some retired soldiers have sued the chief of defense staff for detections in their gratuity. This follows the military's delay in filing its defense. The case has meanwhile been adjourned in plea. We're taking a break now. When we come back, we bring you entertainment. Entertainment news is brought to you. It's time for entertainment, Miss G is here. Good evening to you, Miss G. Good evening, Israel. How are you doing? I'm, I'm fine. Uh, it's obvious from what you're looking like that you've had fun this weekend. Have I? Oh, I thought you were talking about my look. I'm back to my kakai look, you know. <laughs> mm, I can love. Yeah, we like it. You like it, like it. Which, Whichever way you do it, I mean, whatever you decide to do, we're, we're cool with you. You're, you're cool with me, huh? Yeah, yeah. I'm cool with you as well. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. So let, let's get to business. You know, today is 25th of January. Yeah. And we've all been waiting after the 19th of January that this day will come. Because this is a day why it's a guest to go to court. And we're all expecting to hear some good news. Good news. Yes. Good hopefully. news as in probably he's being let off the hook or exactly. he's being fired. Yeah, so that it can't you know, be good news. Which ah, but whichever way it's at least it, it puts the case to rest. Okay. But unfortunately, Weiser showed up in court today without his counsel because we hear the counsel allegedly says that the terms of negotiation for his appearance was not met. So he didn't show up. And then the prosecutors also show up without evidence again. And so this time around, the court has given them up to the 5th of February to produce evidence. To produce evidence. I'm, I'm wondering why it's, the funding is so difficult. This is the evidence we're talking about. I mean, they, <laughs> we have taken this along to the... Exactly. Well, you, you know, funny it, enough... Th this doesn't qualify. Funny enough, what we were told was that the place where the evidence was, was under lock. And whoever was keeping the key wasn't around. The last time they went to court, I thought I heard them say that it was, it was, it was difficult for them to produce a witness. Mm. It was difficult for the prosecution to produce a witness. This time around is about evidence. So I, I well, well, whichever way. Okay. Whichever so way they've been giving some time. Yes, yeah, up to the fifth to produce the evidence. Yes, to produce evidence, you know. By or I guess probably risk uh, the case being thrown out. I think. That what tends to happen. I think. I think. I think. Well. Right. Unfortunately, his counsel didn't show up as well. But let's go to some more exciting stories. At least we can heave a sigh of relief. And I had a fantastic way to came, like you said. I said it. Oh. I said it. Said it. Said it. Said it. Said it. <laughs> Did you? Tell me more about it. I swear you small. <laughs> Tell me more I'll about swear, it. I swear you small before I come to what I did over the weekend. You know the song, Skolo? Yeah. Uh, ooh, baby. Skolo. Skolo. And you know that portion of the song? VVIP. Yes. Yeah, the chorus was done by Sena Dagadu, yeah. who is hung Hungarian Ghanaian. She's based in Hungary, and she's not here. She That's came. a wild combination. That's like one of Kubala's combination kind of combination. No, one of his Romanian. Yeah, so Romanian, okay. Ghanaian, and <laughs> Hungarian. Ghanaian. It so, all has a Rien at the end. of the end. <laughs> okay, so she's in town, and she's been telling us how busy she was with kebab when the idea for Skolum came on. Um, I was sitting with Zeal and, um, and Reggie eating kebabs and, um, and Zeal just took out his phone. We we're listening to each other's music because I, um, I hadn't seen them in a while. So this was last year. And Zeal took out his phone and played this beat. And I weeped 
like I was I was instantly totally weak from the beat and, um, and so we're just vibing to it he started singing the idea for the hook the and um, and then at that moment, like I wrote the first lines for the verse that evening when I went home, I finished the verse and like a few days later, we just went to the studio and vibed on it and just recorded it really quickly because the song is so nice and catchy and infectious that we didn't have to think too much about it. We just did it. It, it has been overwhelming. People really love the song. What do you think we did the trick? You know, I have no idea. I really don't know because, I mean, we knew the song was nice and we wanted to record it. I've worked with Reggie before on different kind of uh, things before, but nothing ever hit like, like this track. Sometimes it's the thing that you don't hold too much, the thing that you just allow and do out of fun because your heart desires it and you don't make like serious plans for it. Those are the things that actually carry, the light-hearted things. So I suppose maybe it's just the light-heartedness and the good energy we put into the song that made it hit like that. Yeah, yeah. One of my favorites. Yeah, yeah. I have, I have yeah. this one on uh, my playlist. Okay, okay, yes. okay, okay. Scolum. Scolum. Mmm, baby. All right. And Scolum is supposed to mean something. Or What's that? Scolum. Like a drop of something. Something has dropped into Scol something or entered into something. Okay, like yeah. something dropping into water. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> no, you said something has dropped into let's, something, so something dropped into water. Anyway, so I had some fun over the weekend. My good friends from the UK, okay. Crumbs and Flavor, after we did the war nanny no thing with them, they're back in town. This time around, they said they are taking over. And so, taking over where? Taking over Africa, Ghana, and the whole world. I had some fun with them. We left out as well at the same time. So, and we've got a nice relationship with the Ghanaians here. So, we like to come here first hand, give it to them first hand, get to meet people first hand, and just enjoy the vibes with them. So, is that to say that you haven't played the song anywhere in the UK? It's not been released in the UK already? Yeah, we released it in the UK, but it's like, raw. we. It's it's because of Ghana we do you know Afro beats you know there's the reason uh, Ghanaians are the reason why we make African music you know what I mean and it's the Ghanaian vibe that we put into our music anyway so we just you know regardless we come out and show love man oh great so if UK is a big market like we believe it is why think of Ghana it's not even just man thinks about only Ghana think about as Kev said the whole world but we're Ghanaian as well that's our first love our home country so. So we, if I'm speaking tree, Kev speaking Ghana, it's only right we come and, you know, bring it out to the Ghanaians as well. Mm. Yeah. I think someone will say, okay, they come down here to pay payola. Do you pay payola? <laughs> I wish I even knew what that was. But you don't know what payola is? No. Do you just take anything from music for playing your songs? Um, no. Just, no, not that I know of. Payola is the first time I've actually heard the word. Really? Yeah. So how does it happen for you? Literally, we just walk to the station, go in there, say, yo, we're calling the from London, we have a few songs we'd like to play to you, and then we just get cracking from there. Is it that easy to penetrate the Ghanaian market? Um, is it that easy? I, I, I won't say it's that easy. You have to, you know, I don't feel like these Ghanaians, just because you're from London, they just love you, no. I feel like the, the, the music is good too, man, because uh, I know a couple of people that's come to Ghana and they haven't made the noise that they thought they were going to make or they were expecting to get, you know what I mean? So, hard work pays, to be honest. You know what they do, we be coasting. Right, so uh, Miss G goes out there and uh, it's supposed to be dancing with Cramps and Flavor. I know it's been after several hours of rehearsals. <laughs> <laughs> and then she's she's trying to you know put put herself out as somebody who can really dance. Oh really? It, how I, many I, hours? Okay, just confess. How many hours did it, it take? It didn't take us. It, it didn't take us up to five minutes to do the move. Of course, it's not a kung fu dance, so it was easy for me to adjust. You know, Please. even just that it there was a portion hours. that was like a bajai, and I was like, I couldn't even break well. It, it, it took was fun. You, it took you several hours. No, you lie. It was fun hanging out with constant flavor, but I could imagine. Mm, yeah. Now, you know that Solomon Sampa passed away last oh, Friday yeah. at age 70. He's worked with some fantastic Ghanaian actors, and David Dontor is one of them. And this is what he has to say about Sam Solomon Sampa. Solo is a very light-hearted, kind-hearted someone who has dedicated virtually all his life to theatre. When I first entered Ghana Theatre Club, the early 80s at the Art Centre, 
where he was with uh, Mel Brown, Abel Kine, and many others. He was one person who always tried to encourage you to, you know, uh, do it because um, he believed that everybody could act. I think that we've lost a great, great practitioner in the industry in the sense that uh, the experience and the knowledge that that man has for us from production are concerned. We don't have anyone to compare with him. Yes, uh, it's a loss. Yes, Solomon it is a when, when I heard it, in fact, I saw it on social media. I was just hoping that it was one of those stories that usually come up on social media and it turns out that the person is really dead. Unfortunately, it's been confirmed. Yeah, it's passed. been confirmed that he's dead and he passed, leaving a wife and eight children, you know, four girls and then four men as well. So well, may his soul continue to rest in peace. As time goes on, we'll bring details to our viewers about the preparation towards this barrier sure. because as of Saturday, his brother said that they were yet to meet as a family and the autopsy will be carried today and then later they'll convey the message of preparations or a barrier for no arrangements to us. So. Yeah. But as a veteran actor, he's been around, he's acted in several movies. Mm -hmm. uh, he's mm -hmm. been around for a really, really, really long And lots of people, they remember him for one of the commercials he did for Original Hacks. And with the itch and thing, yeah. you know, that kind of, yeah, that was early, uh, late 90s or so. And lots of people remember. Were you born by then? Oh, please, Israel. How like, in the 90s? I'm just asking you. I was born. born in the 70s. Where were you when I was born? <laughs> No, like, where are right. you? That's all right. Okay. That's all right. Now you believe me, I was one in the 70s, in fact, 60s, you know. All right. So, it's a lot of talk about Samini and Shatawale reunite, uh, uniting or reuniting. I remember that some time ago I told you that uh, Samini had said that he has much love for Shatawale's Kakai, Kakai song, song and yeah. he says it was a banger. Now, apparently, Samini was granting a radio interview recently and one of his management team tells me that what happened was that whilst they were on the... Presenter, no, Stoneboy asked to speak on the show and then they allow Stoneboy. And then I, one who is also a reggae artist, asked to speak on the show, they allowed it. And then the presenter said, How about getting Shatawali? And also. Samini said, Okay, no problem. And uh, Samini, uh, Shatawali got on, they spoke for quite a number of times. The line went over here, Shatawali called again. And so these guys say they are getting together, they might be putting. There's a truce. So here's a package for you. For years, the two waged what could be passed as the fiercest war of worse in Ghana's music industry over who is a dancehall king in Ghana. The war degenerated into personal attacks and it manifested in their music, on social media, on stage and on air. Samini took the biggest of jabs from Shata Wale, who released a number of songs using profane and words to insult him and his family. But Samini said on an Accra base plus FM Friday that he has forgiven Shatawale for all the direct insult he threw at him and he is ready to open a new page this year. He said, and I quote, there is peace and unity between me and Shatawale. The East Koki Head singer said, I forgave Shatawale in 2015 because there's no need in keeping past hurts. Samini said he had always known Shatawale was a good musician and he is ready to work with him any day to conquer new grounds with the Afro dancehall genre. While Samini was on air, Shatawale was also called on phone and he confirmed that he had nothing personal against Samini and that he had always respected him. He said, and I People need to know that whatever has gone on between me and Samini is nothing personal. It is all business, and so people should watch out for us this year. Well, we're just hoping that everything, I mean, they just get to settle everything and we don't hear any more of these uh, back true, and forth. True, yeah. true, true. And uh, Samini is promoting his breaking news album. He will be here at Multimedia tomorrow. So remember that we'll bring you something exciting right, from sure. Samini as well. So before I go, it's Chris Rock who is saying that he's not boycotting the all-white Oscars. Well, yeah. Yes. I was saying that I was hoping that he was going to boycott. No, 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 no. I it's business. Look, one man's poison is another, another man's meat. Why should I boycott if you have not been nominated? I have been called to come and host the show. So he is not boycotting it. He will be there presenting. And then interestingly, what, what, what I, so I was just reading the article mm -hmm. uh, on Entertainment Weekly, and it turns out that Chris Rock is saying that rather than boycotting, he's actually gone back yes. and he's trying to rewrite the script mm -hmm. to come up with jokes that would include uh, Oscar.
Oscars. Uh, or, Just to know. ridicule like the all white Oscars and to make a yeah. point as and well. Apparently, the Academy mm. doesn't have a problem with that. But the Academy actually supports that initiative. Mm. So. I guess we're going to be having some fun. Some exciting on, uh, Oscars, Oscars this night. year. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, Israel, that is it. And the entertainment news was brought to you by Airtel, the smartphone network. Entertainment news was. Time for sports now, and Gary Smith is here. Good evening to you, Gary. Hello, Israel. How are you? Doing well, thanks. It's been a great weekend for you? Yeah, it's, well, it's all right. I mean, yeah. okay. a bit of work, a bit of this and that. What's coming up on sports? Well, top story is that, two top stories. Um, what's the rule for breaking news story? The one that happened the most closer, right? The most recent. The most recent. So, um, Christiana Chu has signed for Malaga in Spain oh, okay. on loan. And Gerard Ankara has resigned as MD of Hearts. Right, so hold on. So Christian Achu from Chelsea? Yes. I thought he was going to Levante. Levante. You know, he even told the BBC that he had told the Chelsea players he was going to Levante. And then, just around 6 o'clock, we got the news that he's going to Malaga. So, I mean, these things happen in the transfer window. Well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so long as he's going to get some playing time, he's going to prove himself. It. That's it. Okay, but That's the it. one that shocked me, actually, yeah. was hearing that Gerard Ankara had resigned. Had, as, from heart to folk. Uh, how did that happen? The I mean, kitchen was too hot. He got, he's been in the job for, you Just know, like a few months, really. Yes, 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 yes. Wow. Yes. All right, you give us the details. Okay, so thank you for joining us on Sports on Prime. I am Gary Al Smith, and as I was just saying, Gerard Ankara is no more the managing director of Accra Hearts of Folk. The man resigned just about a couple of hours ago in what we understand um, is a decision he took because things were not happening the way he wanted at the club. You might recall that Gerard Ankara took the job in September of 2014 and in a space of just a couple of months he's been unable to be able to uh, do a have a lot of changes there. Now, one of the key reasons we understand is that he feels that his authority in the club is waning and he's not doing well. So that's the latest from Accra Hearts of The Premier League club's battle to be ready for the start of the season is not going too well as well. Moving to other stories, and Albert Komi, the CEO of Indiana Stars has been speaking about the start to the league. On February 20th, the Ghana Premier League will resume. And we asked him what is going on with this side. Sorry for the breaking transmission due to a couple of technical challenges. However, I was taking you through the story involving Adriana Stars. The Premier League begins on February the 20th and teams are getting ready. Adriana Stars have had a great recruitment drive and we spoke to Albert Komi, the CEO of the club, about what his team is doing to have a fantastic campaign when it all begins next month. Well, don't... don't um, this point that um, January to February of preparation have started already with teams. I know, for instance, tentatively we set 20th of December for the league to start, but for these litigations and those things. So we have enough time. We've trained all this while, and I think that um, all teams are ready. You can see the football fever already in the air. Uh, as for the level, it depends on the team and what they've done. Sometimes what happens is that because you don't know when the league starts, the coaches will do what they call the general training. But now that they know the date, they'll step up and know when, when to do what, at what time. Yeah. You can get more pre-season news on the Ghana Premier League on myjoyonline.com. In table tennis this weekend, there was an amazing tournament at the Accra Sports Stadium. The top eight event 
came and Felix Lati won. Now, the top eight event was essentially a competition for the best eight table tennis players in the country. It was a great crowd, and it was yet another um, boon in the feather of the cup of the so-called lesser appreciated sports. Mauko Afajinu is the boss of Ghana Tennis, and he spoke to us. Top 8 is our flagship program. It's, the mass, it's like the masters, the champion of champions. In a year, we normally would have a number of tournaments, and the best players, the consistent players throughout the year, then get to play in the Top 8, which is the final program, so to speak, of a season. And it establishes who the grandmaster is. This year, the grandmaster, we realize, is Felis um, uh, Lati. And we also realized um, who the grandmadam was. That's why we played the top eight. The top eight is a challenge to the players to, and it's a call for consistency. It's a call for you to perform at the highest level throughout the year without dropping your guard. That's why the prize money, for example, in the top eight is always important for us. We had a league which ensured the players were active throughout the year. We had a number of competitions. We went to all African games, we won bronze love to win gold, but we are not there yet. Um, we do open the floodgates for all other people to win medals, which is good. And so that level of competition, the intensity, the uh, diligence, the consistency throughout the year reflected in the quality of the game we saw today. Again, um, two of our players have qualified to play in the qualifiers in Hatun next month for the Olympic Games. And again, I can see that some of their peers wanted to prove a point. And so you realize that both our number one seats couldn't make it. Um, we had number two and number three seats winning, which is good for the competition. I also particularly like um, the public participation, which means that a lot more people are getting engaged with the game we love. Table tennis has always been a popular sport among the masses. It's just been the attention, and it's no surprise that there was a very, very good attendance at the Accra Sports Stadium. We look forward to the Olympic qualifiers in Sudan and hope Ghana does well. Speaking of longevity and about qualifying for the Olympics, hockey is a sport that is also looking for its first appearance for Ghana in the Olympics. However, the Citizen International Club launched its 30th anniversary celebration. They've been around for 30 years, and Reverend Lumumenu, the chairman of the planning committee, spoke to us when we, our cameras uh, got to that event. For the 30 years anniversary, um, we're looking at honoring um, people who spearheaded the development of hockey um, in the past. Number one, I, I, I don't know if you know of Madame Theodosia Okun. We're going to have a tournament in her honor, and the tournament will be for schools and colleges. Um, for now, we will be inviting Achimota School, Infantapem School, Addis Adel, Wesley Girls, um, Yasantua, you know, and a few of the top schools, those who've been playing good hockey in the past. Um, not only the students, but we'll also invite the alumni of um, these schools to also participate in the game of hockey and, you know, to have fun here as well. Um, we will also have a tournament which will be a national senior hockey tournament. We have senior teams all over the country and would invite them to come here and play the five teams in Accra. They'll be coming from Cape Coast, coming from Takrade, coming from Poporidia, Kosombo, Kumasi, and you know, come and meet here, us here. Reverend Lomonmenu speaking there. Elsewhere in the world, the Happy Slam is still on. The Australian Open is going to the business end. Andy Murray and Raonic progress to the next round of competition. We have that and also about the fact that Zhang beat Keys 366363. Let's get the highlights of um, all those matches. <laughs> 